name's Jennifer Scott. I am the director and chief curator here at Jane Addams Whole House Museum. I want to welcome all of you to the tribute to Viola Spolin and Paul Sills. We are extremely excited to host you in the event, and it's thrilling to be in the room with so many legends. So thank you all for coming. Um, I just wanted to introduce you to where you are. Um, we are a museum that I'm sure you're pretty familiar with that's a tribute to Jane Addams. Adams and the social reformers who came to this area of the city when it was a slum to work and live alongside their immigrant neighbors here on the west side and to try to create social change for them and make their lives better. And they advocated for immigrants' rights, women's rights to vote, um, so many issues. Uh, they fought against labor exploitation and many, many more causes. And you can learn a lot about that in our museum next door, which I will tell you more about. Um, Today, the museum connects all that we do to uh, present-day social justice issues. And one of the things that surprises people is that um, of the 13 buildings that used to be part of the social settlement on this site, the first building that they built was an art gallery. And that's because the visual arts and the performing arts were central to all the work that they did here in social reform and social change. Uh, there was a 300-seat theater of, of a group called the Whole House Players in 19 six who were created who were amateurs. Um, a very, very rich history that connects to what we're doing today. We have, our current exhibition is called Participatory Arts, and we hope you have a chance to see it. It's exploring the intersection of arts and social change as a part of the Art Design Chicago uh, initiative that was launched last year to look at histories across the city, um, sponsored by the Terra Foundation for American Art. And upstairs, you'll see in the museum is a little space that speaks to this theater history and, and why we're doing all this programming, bringing out this really special history and the connection we have. Um, one of the things I also wanted to point out, if you, if you looked at the flyers as you were coming in, we are doing a special series this summer that starts on June 30th that's going to utilize our courtyard as a people's theater called the Whole House Summer of Theater and we'll be showcasing local improv talent on Sundays especially and doing workshops. So please look for those dates and join us. All of our events are free and open to the public and we invite you all. Um, it's going to be co-curated co with us by uh, an extraordinary um, artist named Angela Oliver, who is connected with Second City. Um, the museum will be open immediately after the tribute during the reception. So we don't allow food and drink there, um, but you, you're, you're welcome to go and wander and enjoy. Also, after the program, our uh, gift shop upstairs in this building will be open to you. Um, there's many, many people to thank for this program, all of our partners. I especially want to thank our Master of Ceremonies, Mark Larson, and of course, Aretha Sills, who helped so much to make this happen uh, and shape the program. And a big thank you to all the Spol and, and Sills family, especially Carol Sills and Neva Sills. Um, also, um, Beth Kligerman and the Second City, who are one of our partners. Um, Cornelia McNamara Flowers and Parties for providing all of these gorgeous flowers that you see, these arrangements. Uh, thank you to Can TV for covering the event. It'll be accessible later to all of us. And also, during the reception, we have a wonderful artist that we work with um, a lot, uh, named Sadie Woods, who's gonna be our DJ. Um, also, thank you to our photographer, Sarah Larson, and, there's, and to Jared and Meg, who are going to be available to collect stories and testimonials, and you'll, you'll hear more about that later. Um, I also definitely, definitely want to thank our staff at Hull House. Um, it's hard to see here because I think Ross Jordan is the only one in the room right now because they're probably going around making sure everything goes smoothly. Uh, but we have about 15 staff members who put a lot of work into all that we do here and, um, and none of this could happen without them. So very, very grateful. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and I want to pass this along to Lisa Laws from DCASE. All right. 
Uh, Jennifer mentioned my name is Lisa Laws. I am the first deputy commissioner for the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. And on behalf of Commissioner Kelly and Mayor Lightfoot, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for Jennifer for all of her hard work. I actually Googled you before this, Jennifer, and um, it said you have over 25 years experience. I don't really, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> But congratulations. Um, rising from a city of innovators, risk takers, big hearts, and broad shoulders, Chicago theater has always been um, a hotbed for exciting new, new work and hundreds of new premieres every year. From Broadway musicals or for plays and improvs, the spirit of the city can really can be found in over 200 plus theaters across the city, which we're really proud of. Um, this year, the City of Chicago and the League of Chicago Theaters is celebrating the spirit by designating 2019 as the Year of Chicago Theater, so very exciting. Um, this citywide year-long focus on theater is the first of its kind in the U.S. and features performances and special events throughout the city, so be sure to check those out. As part of the Year of Chicago Theater, and the acronym is like YACHT, <laughs> we can just say Year of Chicago Theater. Last year it was easy, it was Year of Ch uh, Chicago Youth or Creative Youth, so it was like YOSI, but this year it's YACHT. Um, we've increased our marketing support for Chicago theaters, provided financial grants for um, theater projects, increased dialogue around inclusion and equity through the um, collaborative call for civic, philanthropic, arts, and business leaders to support the theater in all of Chicago neighborhoods, so very exciting. We are honored to be asked to participate in tonight's event, so thank you. As the whole house of legacy, legacy of Jane Addams is an integral part of the spirit of Chicago theater. The auditorium and theater programs at Hull House embrace the multi-ethnic crowd that gave birth to Chicago's noted improvisational theater. And under the direction of Miss Viola, we're very excited about this. Now, I did a few um, Googles before this, and I was going to do this whole speech in gibberish, but I decided <laughs> to save you all and do it in English. But I'm just saying, I'm, I think I'm pretty good at it at this point. Um, this history continues to inform Chicago theater and Chicago arts today. Artists that are equally committed to using their creativity and in brave and fearless ways in pursuit of social change. And so we are happy to salute them tonight and the whole House Museum for the extraordinary impact, extraordinary impact that you have had on Chicago. Let's continue to make history together and let's keep up the good work, guys. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> I forgot to mention that the whole house is part of the College of Architecture, Design, and the Arts at the University of Illinois, and one of our cherished partners is here, Dr. Christine Dunford, who we work with a lot. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I know that over the years, many, many people have felt at home in this room and at home in Hall House, at Hall House, and um, I feel at home tonight particularly because tonight is an opportunity for me to appreciate, um, um, to appreciate and reflect on the immense contributions of Viola Spolin and Paul Sills to Hall House, to Chicago, to theater, and to the world. Almost everything that I have built, personally, professionally, a theater company, Looking Glass, an education community outreach program, and a program that uses improvisational activities to improve quality of life for people experiencing, experiencing memory loss associated with Alzheimer's and other dimensions called the Memory Ensemble, is directly responsible and has been built on the ideas and the practices introduced here at Hull House by Neva Boyd, by Viola Spolin, and by Paul Sills. My entire career. Likewise, many times during my time as director of the UIC School of Theater and Music, I've been energized by a profound sense of common purpose and common understanding across time. Our common understanding is that human beings engage in the arts to make sense of being in the world. And our common purpose is to deploy the arts to improve the experience of being in the world and indeed the world itself. Theater and music has been a part of UIC since U UIC was at Navy Pier. And today, we educate over 230 students from diverse backgrounds, mostly from across the city and the region. Uh, and our mission is to develop practical knowledge, cultural sensitivity, intellectual resourcefulness, 
and an imaginative daring in emerging artists and scholars. I think the same mission that Jane Addams, all the folks at Hall House, Viola Spolin, and Paul Sills have had throughout their lifetime and their careers, and we are proud to share that in common with them. I want to thank Jennifer Scott and the team for inviting me to say just a few words this evening. It is a great honor to be here, part of your program. Thank you. Thank you. Now to start our tribute off, I want to call up our wonderful partner in crime and Masters of Ceremonies, Mark Larson, who is also a fantastic author and has an, an exciting book call, coming out called Ense Ensemble, an Oral History of Chicago Theater, and you'll see some glimpses of those oral histories during the program. Um, please welcome Mark, and we will be hosting Mark's book launch on August 12th, so you'll have an opportunity to come back to Whole House to celebrate another important event. Mark Larson. Thank you. Um, well, welcome to the first ever Paul Sills and Viola Spolin tribute. It's usually when you say first ever, it's kind of an exciting thing. In, in my mind, it's ridiculous. This is taking so long, <laughs> but it's high time. It's definitely high time. And I think the year of Chicago theater is a pretty proper time to do it. And I think the Hull House Theater, I mean the Hull House Museum, is a terrific place to be, be hosting this. So thank you to our hosts. This is the perfect setting. Um, I also want to mention, before I contribute my little part to this, um, there's a lot of Silses in the room. And, and that is really thrilling to me, personally. Um, this is an invited crowd here, and I want you to understand what it is that we're doing. Can TV here is, is recording this. You've been invited because you're special, and what we're hoping is that after the program, you will meet up with Jared or Megan, and if you have recollections that you would like to share about Viola or Paul and their influence on you, we'd love to hear it and capture it. We're hoping this would be the beginning of capturing lots of these stories, so please be a participant, too. I'd like to ask um, the Sills family, anyone who's, uh, who's willing to do it, to please stand for us and show yourself. <laughs> Okay, so now I was all about to cry. <laughs> this, you know, if you're looking for an overly sentimental MC, <laughs> you can check me out at wimpy.com. That, that about did me in. I'm just, um, but welcome to all the Sills and all the friends and all the extended family and the wonderful people who are in this room. And as Jennifer said, there are legends in this room, and we're about to meet some of them now. Um, each, each person is going to have about five minutes to, to talk about what it, you know, but their, the influence of Sills and Spolin has been on them. We're also going to see some dem games demonstrated that Aretha's going to, to lead to with some of the participants. So we're, we're really excited to do this with you. Here's my part. Here's my little part. I once put the question to Richard Christensen, who's the great trib uh, Chicago Tribune um, critic, who I think played a huge role in helping shape the Chicago theater scene, especially in his formative years. He also chronicled the history in his book, um, A Theater of Our Own, which I think is a wonderful book. And I once put a question to him, and the question was this. If there was one person that if you remove that person from the history of Chicago theater, everything would change. Is there any person that would change everything if he or she was removed? And he said without pause, Paul Sills. Without pause, he said, Paul Sills. And the reason I think it's important that we're 
we're, we're doing this tonight and getting this started tonight is their influence is absolutely vast. I spent the last uh, four and a half years working on, on the book that she mentioned and talking to people, they either reference Paul and Viola uh, directly by name or as you listen to them, you know they've been influenced by Paul and Viola. It is, it is vast. And I wanted to give you a, a sense of that. And this is a very short reading from my book. It's from the pol uh, prologue, and it's called Past is Prologue, the Offspring of Viola Spolin, which I thought was appropriate for tonight. Here, here's how it goes. When Steppenwolf Theater Company opened the front bar adjacent to their theater in 2016, they had grown into a 41-year-old institution with a rich and influential history, not just in Chicago, but nationally and internationally. The decor of, of their bar includes here and there mementos of their history. A globe light recalls the now defunct O'Rourke's Tavern, which had once been an important, had an important place uh, for the ensemble members to meet other theater members. Bookshelves are displayed with, pardon me, this is really hard for me to read, it's in italics and I can't hardly see it. <laughs> Who published this? <laughs> um, the, the bookshelves are arrayed with all sorts of different mementos, is, is what I'm getting at. And they, they include like a Buddha, which is, is reminiscent of Martha Levy, their artistic director. And there are lots of books. And they are carefully chosen books. I talked to Le Lauren Spivak, who is the curator of that space. And she said all of these were chosen because they meant something to the Steppenwolf Company. One of those books is Viola Spohn's 1963 groundbreaking work, Improvisation for the Theater. And you can see it there, it's right on the trunk. That's in the front bar at Steppenwolf Theater. I think that's pretty cool. This, the, the book had a lot of impact on them. During the company's foundational years in the 70s, they met a director and a teacher named Sheldon Patinkin, who at the age of 17 had worked with Spolin and her son, director Paul Sills. Patinkin soon became an important influence on the Steppenwolf founding members. Sheldon, uh, Jeff Sweet, or Jeff, Jeff Sweet, <laughs> Jeff Perry, one of the founders of Steppenwolf, said that uh, Sheldon would teach us improv games using a range of exercises that go back to Viola Spolin and, and Sills himself. He took us through a lot of exercises that had to do with being aware of the other person, being open to the moment, and physicalizing character. We love that work, Jeff said. And it has really, it has really stuck with me, both as an actor and as a teacher. By way of, by way of Sheldon, and Viola's work, Steppenwolf Theater, like so many other Chicago theater companies, is hereditarily linked to the founders, the, um, in, I'm sorry, originators, uh, is hereditarily linked to the originators of the Chicago theater movement. I'm sorry, I don't know why it's this moving to me, but it is. And I'm looking right at Aretha and Carol Sills. The first voice in the book is Aretha Sills. She speaks right after that introduction, and what she says is that work was the product of a lifetime, meaning the book. Aretha is one of Viola's actual genetic offspring. The rest of us you know, are metaphoric, <laughs> uh, no offense, but we are. The rest of us, the, she is Viola's granddaughter and Paul's daughter. She is dedicated to carrying on their work in its purest form, with a loving, caring, and this is what I admire, insistent hand. <laughs> she conducts workshops, as she did yesterday, and will be tomorrow, and I think the next day. She gives talks all over the place. What a pleasure it is to know you, Aretha, and to call you a friend. You, I really admire you, and you really inspire me, Aretha Sills.
Hello, hello everybody. Oh my goodness, now you got me choked up. <laughs> With the allergies too, this will be fun. Um, <clears throat> well, here she is, uh, Viola. Um, thanks so much to all of you for coming to this tribute to Viola Spol and, and Paul Sills. And um, I also need to thank everyone who helped this event come to be. Um, the sponsors and especially the wonderful Hull House crew, Jennifer. Ross, Jennifer's gone now, but, and all the educators and helpers, um, and Mark Larson, who did so much to make this happen. Thank you all. So it is, it really is incredibly moving. And it's incredibly fitting that this first ever tribute to Viola and Paul happens here at Hull House, where Viola met Neva Boyd. So it turns out that my job at this event is to tell you about Jane Addams, Neva Boyd, and Viola in five minutes. So, we're going to jump right in. Um, so, will you go to the, oh, there she is. Look, he's, you're on it. He is so on it. All right. Take a look at the young woman we're talking about. <laughs> Just take a minute and really take her in. This is who we're talking about. This says more than I can in an hour, right? was born in Chicago in 1906 to a family of Russian Jewish immigrants. She was an energetic, totally modern girl. She went to Lakeview High School where she played basketball. She was really good. Baseball. She wore red lipstick, men's clothes, bob men's overalls, bobbed hair, and she ran around with her girlfriends in an old Model T Ford. Um, you can show that one. Moving on. Yeah. That is her with the gun, naturally. <laughs> Spark. <laughs> How appropriate is that, right? Okay. After high school, her sister uh, Pauline took her to see Neva Boyd, who held classes in group work at Hull House. And there's um, Miss Boyd, as Viola called her. What we call that uh, she, group work, we now call it social work. Um, she had a recreational training school, both at her home and at Hull House. She would rent space here. And Neva Boyd was an early theorist of the uses of play in education and social work. Um, and in, she was an innovator in the training of social workers. And Viola studied with Miss Boyd from 1924 until her first son Paul was born in 1927. And Neva Boyd believed children learned many things through play, among them what she called social values, meaning children learned to work out differences um, and to value each member of a group through play uh, because they have a shared goal to keep playing, just to keep the game going. They learn how to compromise and, okay, you do this this time. You, you can go play third base now. Um, and when Boyd says social values, she's in conversation with Jane Addams and her philosophy of social ethics. Um, the idea that democracy functions best if we all get out of our own limited spheres uh, and meet people who are not like us, <laughs> you know, and get to know what they need and what their concerns are um, and walk the common road, as Jane Addams said. Um, and so Boyd was saying, play does this. Right? Um, and so after training with Neva Boyd, Viola worked with recent immigrants, orphans, church groups, and lots and lots of neighborhood kids. Um, but from childhood, Viola was drawn to the theater. Um, in the 1930s, Viola majored in dramatics at DePaul, um, DePaul's night school. There's a photo. <laughs> from there, there she is, Viola Sills, who has noted role. <laughs> yeah, she will play Mrs. Fisk in the DePaul play tonight. Um, she studied at the Goodman Theater, and with the group theater in New York, she went all the way to New York. She absorbed knowledge about the theater in every way possible for a newly divorced single mother. And um, naturally, she began to teach dramatics, working mostly with recent immigrants with limited English and with children. And every time Viola encountered a problem when directing her players. Inspired by Neva Boyd, she created a game uh, with a focus to help her players learn through playing. Um, and true play, as we know, also helps the player enter into the present time with all their senses and their intuition intact. 
and that allows us to solve complex problems without really thinking too much about it, right? Because we're liberated from all the chatter, the cultural, the mental chatter, right? When we play, when we focus. Um, as Viola said, through spontaneity, we are reformed into ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Um, Viola, yeah, I know. That is, <laughs> that deserves, that deserves that, yes. And Viola would eventually create hundreds of theater games, um, and they amount to a, comp my book's under the seat, but you saw an earlier edition. They amount to a complete actor training method, and Maybe, you know, very interestingly in our modern era, a very radical non-authoritarian teaching method, which needs, you know, like, get, check it out, teachers. Um, she published this lifetime of research in 1963 as Improvisation for the Theater, the book that launched the improvisational theater movement in the US and transformed and in some ways democratized the American theater. I recently came across a quote from Viola that explains why she was the spark that ignited this new form of theater. And this is from a letter she wrote to David Shepard, who was co-founder of Compass um, in 1955. And David was planning to write, uh, Jeff Sweet will talk about him a little bit, I believe. J David was planning to write a book on how to start an improvisational theater. And Viola was saying, hold up there. <laughs> she was reminding him that the work he was doing had a source. Her and Neva Boyd, um, he quote, and this is a long quote, but it's really good. Uh, her, I like to hear, raise her voice. I was trained to be a settlement house worker, a creative group worker by a great woman, Neva L. Boyd. She believed in the right of creativity for all people, and she, all caps, and she inspired in me this belief. We were taught games, handcraft, storytelling, a forgotten art, dramatic play, creative dramatics, folk dancing, fencing, gymnastics, camping, etc., etc. I studied with this woman more than 30 years ago, and she inspired me so with the right of the individual to his own creativity that I never lost sight of it. Loving the theater passionately, parentheses, directed my first play at eight years old, exclamation point, I moved from community work to put all my time into the theater. Being trained as a group worker, I was able to develop uh, many techniques that the average theater person would not and could not have developed. For the combination of a creative group worker and a creative theater teacher is really remarkable. Ding, I work to develop a tool for the average person. But that doesn't mean change the slide. We'll, we'll have to go back. I sought to free my theater from exhibitionism and compulsion and competitiveness through actions, not words, techniques. I ate, slept, dreamed, and worked, much as a laboratory worker, always seeking d direct exercises that would be self-revealing, exciting, and refreshing, and yet carry the responsibility of the art form within them. I don't expect to get rich on my book. It's just all that all the past years of work will be fulfilled. I simply want authorship. Thank goodness she was a fighter, right? And, and David was a mensch, so it all worked out. <laughs> Jane Addams once wrote, quote, the creative power in the people themselves will come out only if it has a chance. Whew. Viola and Paul would prove to be an example of that explosion of culture and community that Hull House made possible and that continues on in Chicago theater to this day. Um, Viola cre also created two remarkable sons, and her firstborn was Paul Sills. And so we need to go back. Here he is, <laughs> drinking at the mother's milk of play. That's Neva Boyd's lap he's on. Can you believe that? And look at that baby. <laughs> look at those eyes. And um, yeah, take that kid in. <laughs> and on the Hull House stage, being directed by Viola. There's Paul, in the, this is on the Hull House Theater stage. Viola's directing, look at all the neighborhood kids. And Paul in the middle with the script on the top of that um, stage furniture there, uh, crying or something, in their short pants, yeah. And anyway, what a scene all those kids are. My time is up. 
So I'll let those images tell the story of how Paul was raised up in this new exciting work and pass and, and, and pass along to Jeff Sweet and Carol Sills, who will talk about the many wondrous and liberating directions uh, in which Paul took this work. As Viola once said, Paul took her work to the world. Um, Aretha just mentioned Jeff Sweet. I'll, I'll give a brief introduction here. He's a playwright and an author. He's written numerous plays, including Kunstler and um, Value of Names, who we were just talking about uh, a few minutes ago. The other thing that's interesting about um, Jeff is that he was the um, one of the original members of the Victory Gardens um, Playwrights Ensemble for You Chicagoans, and I think that's pretty darn cool. Um, he's also the author of, in quite appropriate to t tonight, Something Wonderful Right Away, which is an oral history of the uh, Compass Players in Second City. He's also uh, a classmate of mine from Evanston Township High School, who um, does not remember me, but I remember him very well. Um, but I'm very, I'm very proud to know him, and I'm very proud to introduce him now. Um, and he's also one of the great carriers on of this story. So please welcome Evanston grad, uh, Jeffrey Sweet. It's fun, to, it's fun to be here, particularly uh, because uh, the title of the book, Something Wonderful Right Away, came from Paul Sand. Because at one point I was saying, how, how were you directed by, uh, by uh, Paul Sills? And he would say, well, okay, in this moment, be wonderful. And I said, well, that's what he wanted, was something wonderful? And Paul and Sand said, something wonderful right away. And I thought, well, that's, that's a description of improvisation. So that's where the book came from. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to pick up the story a little bit. Paul has inhaled um, his mother's theories. Uh, from childhood, and he, during World War II, he's in the Merchant Marine, he comes out, he goes to the University of Chicago, which has no theater department, which doesn't stop him, uh, and he starts putting on plays uh, with a sort of an insurgent group, uh, putting on sort of alternative plays, including some American premieres of Brecht. Uh, I have to go back and refer to uh, somebody who's already mentioned, the last time I saw Aretha, we were at his memorial, David Shepard. David Shepard was the Marxist son of a millionaire, just to establish a slight contradiction, and he, think, he thought that everybody should have theater in their lives, and his first expression of this was he put together a production of Moliere, which he toured through the Catskills, <laughs> and was shocked when uh, rarely was the audience larger than the size of the cast. Having lost a fair amount of his father's money, uh, he decided to cast his fate to the winds and hi uh, hitched a ride with a truck driver to go wherever the truck driver was going to take him, and then the truck driver took him here. And um, so he hopped off and he was trying to find out where the action was at, and the action was uh, at the University of Chicago. So remember, he's, uh, he loves, he, he's, he's a Marxist and he loves theater. And he hears about a production of the Caucasian Chalk Circle. So this checks two boxes at the same time. And he goes to see the production, and the production is directed by, by Paul Sills. And he says, I've got to know this guy. And they sit and they talk, and David's got some money. And he decides that he wants to open a, um, a professional classical theater company, and he wants Paul to direct. And it's, I think Mark will confirm this, that this is the first storefront theater in Chicago. So the whole storefront theater movement starts with uh, Paul and David putting, uh, putting up plays. But at a certain point, David gets really antsy because they're putting on plays about kings and people who are very sophisticated who hold cocktails. And he, think, he begins to think that uh, the theater should reflect the audience. And so he wanted to put on plays about the people of Chicago. The problem was that nobody was writing these plays. So how do you put on plays if they aren't written? And this is where David makes his key contribution. He uh, remembers from his theater studies the Comédie de l'Art, uh, which was a form of theater that flourished during the Renaissance, in which traveling players would improvise plays from outlines that were tacked up on the walls backstage. So he decides, OK, we're going to, uh, we're going to do a new version of that, and we're going to improvise plays based on outlines. And he convinces Paul that this is a good idea to do. And the first one they do is a piece called The Game of Hurt, which is a based on an outline that uh, Paul has uh, adapted freely from the mayor of Casterbridge. 
and it is about a, a salesman who's in a bar. He's very drunk and abusive with his wife. And the drunker he gets, the more abusive he gets. And finally, he says to her, you're worthless. And in fact, uh, I'd sell your ass for $5. And there's a steel worker down at the end of the bar who's looking at this, at this woman, who's played by Elaine May, by the way, and says, I've got $5. And the wife looks at the steel worker and says, sold. <laughs> <clears throat> Takes the $5, hands it to her husband, and goes off and spends the night with the steel worker. And the uh, salesman wakes up the next morning and realizes he has been, um, I'm going to use moderate language because there are young ears in the room, uh, and uh, a sad person. Um, and he gets up and, uh, and tries to persuade her to come back. And eventually, he's able to persuade her to come back. And the audience goes, wow, we've never seen anything like that. And so for uh, week after week, they would put up an original hour-long play, which is based on an outline which reflected uh, Chicago life. And the bartender said, this is great. Could we have the um, uh, actors, uh, could we have the show be half an hour longer? And somebody says, well, it takes us a week to come up with an hour's worth of material. And somebody in the room says, what do you say we use these techniques we've been learning and take suggestions from the audience and spontaneously create scenes? And that's where the whole tradition of taking suggestions from the audience to create scenes comes from out of the imperative to sell another beer. <laughs> So, and they sell a fair number of beers, uh, so that's successful. Anyway, uh, the, small, the shorter scenes take over the program, and out of these shorter scenes, you get Mike Nichols and Elaine May and Shelley Berman. Compass eventually closes out of its own contradictions, and Nichols and May and Berman go off and become very successful. And uh, Paul, who has been managing a nightclub in the meantime, looks at this and with some friends thinks there's something in the wind that this material is succeeding with a larger audience. Let's do a... Uh, a more polished version of the compass. And um, there was an article written by a man named A.J. Liebling which intended to insult Chicago called The Second City, saying there was a second-rate town and there was no culture here except Nelson Algren, whose primary contribution was to throw up at parties. <laughs> and uh, so this was meant to be uh, uh, throwing this back at, uh, in, in Liebling's face, and they opened uh, Second City here. And it, uh, within a year, uh, they were on their way to national and, uh, and international uh, uh, fame. And, uh, and Paul was involved with uh, the various different companies in different cities, and he became dissatisfied, which is probably one of the many times that he became dissatisfied. And he moved on. Uh, and he started, uh, he worked with, uh, created a form called Story Theater, which has also been tremendously influential. If you've ever seen Nicholas Nickleby, that's a lift from Story Theater. And, uh, and Second City continues. And one of the things that's interesting to me about Mr. Sand is that he worked with Viola when he was young. He worked on Second City. And he worked in uh, story theater and won a Tony Award uh, uh, playing story theater on Broadway, which is my way of segueing to Paul Sand. <laughs> you want to cry. I don't, it's, it's, there's something going on in here. Uh, uh, yes, I, I was, it was suggested that I write something, and then I thought, well, I'll improvise something. Uh, and uh, I had uh, a wonderful mother and a wonderful father uh, who listened to their eight or nine-year-old Paul. Uh, about uh, various things I wanted to study, the piano, okay, this and that. And then I went and I saw a play, uh, it was uh, covered with blue light. And I said, <clears throat> I want to be in theater. So my mom called UCLA, the drama department, and said, who is a good teacher for children who won't let the children ruin their lives. <laughs> it, was, it was mom, as I said. And uh, they said, Viola Spolin, uh, we met. And I stayed with her until I was an adult. Uh, I went right into uh, 
the arms of Paul Sills, and then again now into the arms of Aretha Sills. Uh, so uh, I have, I can say that I have been raised completely by the Sills and Spolin family. Uh, so, uh, and so uh, this is what you get. Uh, uh, and I would not have it any other way. It was, uh, I can't say we did this technique or that technique because we were always part of the technique. We were learning the games, some of them as they were growing. Uh, it's the only technique that I knew that I have sort of secretly used on television and everything else. Uh, my, ha my personal happiest time was working with any of the Sills Spolin family. That's where I always felt that I was doing real theater. Uh, everything else kind of was something else. But um, yes, I, I am a, a product on the stage and uh, wonderfully off the stage. Uh, uh, unconsciously using the same technique. Uh, you ought to try it. <laughs> and uh, I know that's under five minutes, but I think I've said everything that need to be said. Thanks. Perfect. Um, Carol Sills. All right, she says. Here she comes. I, by way of introduction, Carol, um, she was Paul's true partner in this work almost from the, the moment that they met when she was a waitress at Second City. Uh, together they conceived of the game theater and the parent school and body politic and it was Carol who came up with the name Body Politic that we, that we all know. In fact, um, she often served as uh, Paul's set designer and, and worked on that as well. And by the 80s, she was Viola's editor. It's hard to get much closer to the source than that. I, I sat down with her in Door County and it was a really special day for me. We sat in her kitchen and I just thought of all the conversations that must have taken place before us in that space. And the first words, I went back to my recording of my conversation with Carol, and their first words were, this is a story of an original American art form. I carried those words with me from that moment forward, and it really helped shape my thinking. Please welcome the wonderful, wonderful Carol Sills. See if you can hear my voice. How's that? All right, now, here we go. I have a series of images here which begin in 1961. What you're looking at here, take a good look. Somebody, this is William Matthew Alaudin having his shoes shined at the entrance to the beer garden, which not everybody knew about the beer garden, but this is 61, Lincoln Park across the street, Second City, almost one, like one city lot away. And that's Dennis Cunningham, an actor, talking to Bill. The boy is David Michael Sills, Paul's son. And that person smoking is Paul Sills. I don't know the name of the shoeshine boy. <laughs> but this is, let's see, 1961. What was it like in Chicago then? I had been there only a year or two, two years. 
I've, I had come from Canada. And Second City was the most interesting place in the entire city of Chicago and had wonderful people there. Chicago is kind of a difficult, racist town. Maybe it still is. Now we're going to move on, and I'll explain. Maybe this is a little soon, but it's pretty good. The point I was going to make is that by 1963, Second City, which was a successful cabaret, had an, uh, also played in New York. And we were there. Paul was uh, directing there. When 63, Kennedy, the president, was murdered. So it, it was a time when we felt that because, uh, I mean, that, that, that event affected everybody quite a bit. And we sought a little more meaningful life. So we moved back to Chicago to be among friends. And uh, we decided one of the things we should do with our friends was to play. And we took Neva Boyd's handbook of traditional games. Aretha goes everywhere with that book. And um, play all the big running games in it with our friends, including Mona Mellis and Dennis Cunningham and the Joanne Shapiro. And there's Mickey LaGlaire on the right. And Mel Spiegel, he was a big student of Viola's. but. Many, many friends. And um, while we were there, uh, so we started in the park. When it got too cold to play in Lincoln Park, Paul said, let's go indoors. We'll go into the club. And the space was a little too small. So we, Paul said, let's play the theater games, which was an um, innocent way of beginning the work. <laughs> mm. And we uh, began to play Viola's theater games. And very soon, the group and Viola decided to start another theater and rented a double storefront and called it the Game Theater. And that uh, Dennis Cunningham was our friend, became the lawyer there. And um, it was a place where every improvisation was in the air. And the famous uh, photographer, Aaron Siskin, came and made a great many beautiful photographs. This is one. And Aaron would move right out into the space where the playing was and uh, make these images that overlapped by um, shooting in a very special way. Here, there's the next one is almost like a cubist vision. That's Dennis. And uh, here, here are Jackie Kronberg and Gloria. I forget her name. I mean, I wish if anybody knows Gloria's last name, it would be helpful. But Jackie and Mona Mellis and um, Joanne Shapiro and other women were also played there. There's more to be said about the game theater. Where are my notes here? I was going to totally improvise. <laughs> At our parents' school, listen, it was also, since we were seeking community, <laughs> just here, all right. Very good. Closer, better. Um, let's see. 
where was I? Parents. Yeah, the parent. We there were children now, and um, Rachel was a little. Our eldest daughter, Rachel Sills, and uh, the Leglaris kid, the Cunningham kid, and others. We can have that parent school slide. There, there, there they are. That's Mona coaching the children as in a running game. And this school, we, was in t we, we were serious about a curriculum that was based on art forms, storytelling, th game theater, painting, a lot of group practice, and there, and it was always full of joy and constant play, which Neva Boyd referred to as a unique discipline. And the parent school took, th this shot is beyond the game theater. The, we were uh, not allowed to conduct a nursery school in a, ca in a bar, so <laughs> we, 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 we went on, and the parent school went on for years, a very wonderful action. And um, so, but also other things occurred there. Ida Turkle, Stud's wife, came and wanted Women for Peace to meet there. So Women for Peace met at the game theater. What other, a lot of community actions were happening there. And uh, I just want to say that I probably didn't mention this, but workshops all week long and on the weekend performances in which audiences were invited to play. All right. This is uh, uh, before, uh, so this was 1965. By 1967, it was occurring to Paul that uh, he uh, could involve himself in ha focusing on uh, material uh, and he adapting stories for the stage. And he, he saw one workshop, he played uh, a theater, uh, a, a Grimm's fairy tale, and discovered it took the exact same amount of time as it would to read it, to, to perform it on stage, which was, oddly enough, a perfect discovery for him. And we, we went on into a period of, this, by the way, is Rumi, which we did years later. That's. Our kid Rachel, the same child that was playing before, on stage with Paul Dooley in a story called The Indian Parrot. All right. Then we, so having discovered story theater, this is a picture of the first story theater company, which meant we, we move on, now it's 1968. That year, which uh, was in, in, in a terrible year in many ways. Remember how they assassinated Martin Luther King in the spring and there was rioting all over the place and in Chicago and then Bobby Kennedy and some of us wanted to uh, have a, a new cabaret where we put the Democratic Party on trial. But <laughs> it so happened that Pete Kelleher, who was the landlord for the Second City building that had moved down the street to North Avenue, invited Paul to use the space for that whole summer. And so, Paul raised a little money and built a stage, and we um, were doing, he, he read a, 
in particular a play called The Blue Light, in which an old soldier gets his revenge on a king, and a whole collection of stories. And this company played, there's uh, Cordis, who's here tonight, and Tom Earhart. Eugenie Ross, Warren Lemming, and Joyce Piven, and a couple of other people that weren't in the shot. But we were, as it turns out, back in the beer garden. See, that's the beer garden. The summer of 1968, which was just picture taken a week or so before the Democratic Convention came to town. And that the police chased the protesters, right? through the beer garden into our sanctuary. The, the theater we had was turned into a sanctuary that week. Following which, we held town meetings in there to um, advise that w the citizens needed neighborhood protection. Let's see, where do we go from here? Yes, I know, I'm looking for my notes. See, I need my notes. Here we are in 1973, where we've moved beyond the 60s, and we won't go beyond this 1973. Paul's show called Sweet Bloody Liberty, which was the American Revolution, the 10 years leading up to the Battle of Bunker Hill, that's Tom Earhart playing James Otis, David Rashi as Joseph Warren, and Hamilton Camp as, I believe, John Adams. Camp, didn't he play Adams? Sam. Samuel Adams. Yes. Camp played Samuel Adams? <laughs> Great. All right. And Then the last picture will show you Cordis playing Liberty, the allegorical figure that they all worshiped. And we still do, some of us, Liberty. There is this uh, early American song dedicated to Lady Liberty. And here she's comforting the first person slain at the Boston Massacre, a black man named Crispus Attucks. And that's Tommy Tolles performing the role. So Paul went on to um, write many, many notebooks full of discussion about this period of history and which he wanted everybody to know. And he's, he, he, he hopes someday that we'll publish his writings on the subject. He said, every American has the duty to pursue liberty and free the people from tyranny. <laughs> and, you know, everything everybody else has said about Paul and Viola, I really appreciate. That's my story.
the person sitting next to you and hold a conversation in gibberish, if you will. Gibberish is nonsense, so shape my language. So we're going to play a quick round of gibberish interpreter, which is a, a very whole house kind of game. Um, so uh, my players here, and you'll recognize some players here. We'll, 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 we don't have too much time, so stand up players. Here, we for both of them in English. <laughs> so take a look, yeah, explore that look, and heighten that look. <laughs> Thank you so much for making this beautiful meal. Give me the chili. It's takeout. <laughs> but you prepare it. You put it on the table. to speak tonight uh, weren't able to be here. They're in LA. And so I recorded some conversations over the phone with, with those people who wanted to participate. So they include uh, a gentleman named um, Patrick Murphy, 
um, who was a teacher at uh, DePaul University. Uh, he, in fact, he was in charge of the actors program there for a while um, and embedded the work of Viola Spolin and uh, Paul Sills into his teaching. It, it was part of the program. Um, so I talked to him a little bit and I talked to uh, three of his students. One was uh, Amy Peetz, who, who went on to um, uh, co-star in a, a show called Caroline in the City, and John C. Riley, who has all kinds of credits to his name, and interestingly, interestingly enough, is right now in Pasadena, Pasadena doing a story theater inspired show with Rick Murphy. So that's what they're doing tonight. And then lastly, there was a gentleman named Kevin Douglas, who's part of the Looking Glass Company. He wrote a play called uh, Thaddeus and Slocum, which you may have seen um, recently. And so they're all going to make their contribution from afar. So here they are. graduate student at the University of Washington. It was 1964, and part of my assistantship was to work in the drama school library. So, uh, Spolin's book had just come out, and uh, it came across my desk, and I had never seen anything like it. And another part of my assistantship was to uh, teach a non-majors course in acting. So I took the, the Spolin book into that class and started right there experimenting with and learning how this extraordinary system of training uh, worked for uh, uh, people who actually were not intending to be actors. So it, it thrilled me to, to be able to see how the, her strategy, games and problem solving uh, worked I'd spent the rest of my life working on So that's how it impacted me. It changed my life. I was really lucky to have met Rick Murphy when I did in Chicago in 1984. Um, yeah, I really came into my own as an actor once I was exposed to the whole Spolin theory and, and all that. You know, there couldn't have been a bigger promoter of Viola Spolin and Paul Sills than Patrick Murphy of <laughs> over all those years at that school. A lot of work that goes on in early workshops, students must think is it's crazy. I think one of the first exercises we did was counting the tiles on the ceiling. And he stated that um, acting was doing, you know, and that it was, that was our focus was to count the tiles and that we would be playing games that would have certain focus to them, and that our only job was to stay on focus of those, those games, and that it was all very experiential. There was very little lecturing about the whole thing, and very pure to us discovering whatever it is we were to discover in the space. We do a space walk, and in a space walk, the goal is to feel space with your whole body. Well, what that has to do with acting must be remote mm -hmm. to a first-year acting student. <laughs> you know, <'cause laughs> they just want to do a play. You know, yeah. they don't want to do a space walk. But for John, he was struck by it. Yeah, I remember coming in, and uh, well, I've been acting since I was a little kid. You know playing theater games of one kind or another and doing musicals. and But I came from a really different reality on the south side of Chicago. And when I came up to DePaul there, I remember thinking like, wow, these people are also kind of, I don't know, I, I guess they, I thought their friendliness, I mistook for phoniness. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just remember feeling That's really out of place at school. I was this working class kid from the south side and and so then I went to Murphy's class, and I remember just my mind being blown, like, wow, this is, this is like the best of, of what I remember acting class to be like when I was a little kid. Paul Sills came to our school and did a workshop. He and Amy Pete did a workshop with our, our professor, Rick, Rick Murphy. Well, actually, it was Amy Pete and Kenny Williams. They came to me. Uh, recommending that uh, I write a grant and see if we could get Paul Sills uh, to um, spend a week with us at DePaul. So I did that. I wrote a grant. And 
he accepted it, uh, at which point I went into a state of panic, realizing that uh, he was going to be down here and seeing the work I'm doing, and I would be revealed for the, the Yahoo I am. You know, <laughs> He was extremely generous uh, and, and genuinely impressed with uh, the work we were doing. And so when we went in, it was, it was almost... I mean, he, he, of course, didn't know this, but it was like, oh, wow, we're, we're, we're about to walk into royalty. This was... <laughs> so everyone wanted to do well, but the, the pressure was gone once, once we met him and started to play the game. And, and hearing him speak and dropping his, his knowledge, it was, it was, I don't know, it was one of the most incredible times I had at school, and it was only one day. <laughs> Sadly, one day, you know. Uh, Sills was astonished as they were working. He turned to me and he said, I could work with any of these people, any of them. Mm. You know. We better really enjoy being in the unknown um, because it is so very frightening for some people, for all of us as humans. You know, we're, we're, we, our brain really, really wants to find the answers right away. And he gave us a path to to feeling safe and comfortable in the unknown. Well, you saw Warren Lemming um, as part of the Story Theater in 1968, um, and you're about to meet him in person here. He's um, He's an actor, and he's also a musician. He was part of a band called uh, Wilderness Road, uh, which became quite well known. And he's recently made a documentary on Ed Asner called Ed Asner On Stage and Off. I wanted to tell you one thing that he, he said to me that I never forgot. He and Paul were very good pals. And this is, this is what, I'm, I'm quoting him. He said, the story of Paul Seals is a quintessential American story because he's someone who took his own time very seriously and attempted to act on his time with all the resources and focus and purpose that he could bring to it. We believed, I still do, that theater is about trying to change people. It's very good to know <laughs> Warren Lemming. Uh, please do. Well, well, thank you, and thank you to Carol and to the Sills girls, who I grew up with, and they with me, and uh, it's, it's an honor, of course, to be here at Hull House, and uh, because it occurred to me in contextualizing, historicizing, whatever, all of this, we have to go back to the beginnings of Chicago, of the fire in 1871, and then in 1886, the merchant class here hung four men and sentenced three others to life imprisonment. They were later pardoned by Altgeld, and it cost him his political career. But I say all this by way of saying that Paul was motivated by something that Hegel called the Zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. And he was always and invariably like Dennis Cunningham, like Carol, in terms of her wonderful remarks about that time, he was always in tune with his time in a way that nobody I ever encountered ever again was. I met two men who were quintessentially, and I knew them well, Chicago. One was Nelson Aldrin, and the other one was Paul Sills. Aldrin wrote Chicago into world literature. Now, the fact that he's still not part of the, of the uh, what Washington puts out in terms of the official story of Chicago and, and, and the US literature is a, is a shame and a crime. But Aldrin will make that cut, just as someday there will be a Sills Spolin day in Chicago and hopefully the country. Because when, 
Paul was a remarkable guy for many reasons, and I, I share some of them with you briefly. When I met him in 1965, uh, I did a, a little thing at the game theater with some people, and he took me uh, back to my apartment around the corner, my little bohemian pad, and he said to me, and I've never forgotten this at the time, he said, uh, I'm part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. <laughs> and I thought, well, you don't hear that a lot uh, <laughs> these days, you know? And, and then went out to, to outline for me what essentially uh, he was about, and if I was interested where we could go with that. And we did share some remarkable interests. We both had a fascination with the Marxist playwright Bertolt Brecht, and Paul was one of the first Brechtians in this country, in fact. And although Brecht is usually badly done here, uh, his productions in both Three Penny and uh, Caucasian Chalk Circle, I think, were, were for their time remarkable. Uh, we also shared an, inter an interest in Martin Buber, whose book I Thou, and whose theories of dialogue influenced uh, Paul's, uh, Paul's approach to those questions. And uh, that, that was an essential part of his dramaturgy, actually. Now, Paul was the only guy I could have this kind of conversation with in terms of Chicago theater, right? Is that there's somehow the Hegelians and the Brechtians and the Buberites didn't show up locally uh, to any extent that I was ever aware of. You know? but, but we had a great time together. He he was a good, good friend to me. And I went uh, through something in retrospect that I call the Sills diversity. And uh, he and I would argue about politics. Because Chicago, of course, is a quintessentially, essentially a political town, always has been. It's founded on a crime. Why wouldn't it be? Uh, Dennis Cunningham, good friend to Paul, was one of the uh, Fred, uh, Mark Hampton, Fred Clark lawyers. That was the longest civil lawsuit by by the way, in the history of this country. So the town, interestingly enough, you know, for those of you drawn to a kind of impish morbidity, uh, is steeped in blood. Uh, Chicago, you can't escape it. Now, the fact that women, Neva Boyd, who I think was also a significant anarchist thinker, as I recall, uh, Neva Boyd, Viola Spolin, Paul et al., um, they knew their Chicago history, and they came from what I would call kind of radical bohemian backgrounds. And that really gave what they did and, and the edge and an edge to Paul's work. Uh, Paul's interest in cabaret also was something that I shared because I had gone to Berlin in the 80s to work or, and, and to be an observer at the Berliner Ensemble, which was Brecht's theater. At that time, it was the German Democratic Republic, and I was living there, uh, having a terrific time with my Stasi handler, and it was a really interesting time to be, <laughs> to be in East Germany. And I remember I remember writing these long, very complicated letters, which I think Carol monitored, and I was telling Paul about my discoveries at the Brecht archive and the dramaturgical insights uh, that, that Lenin and Marx had brought to this situation, and this was going to change the nature of the theater, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, according to Carol, anyway, Paul was delighted by these, and, and, and uh, I, I thought, this is the only guy in the world I could be writing to at this point about this particular stuff. You know, it's just nobody else who would that this would work with okay I thank you very much for your attention thank you for the event
Before I introduce our next, our next speakers, um, I wanted to mention when I did the uh, remote conversations, I, I did want to get in the fact that I talked to Ed Asner, who really wanted to say something too, and it's on me. The recording wasn't great. So, um, but I did want to share two things that he said that kind of stick with me. Um, one of them is something that Aretha had told me he had said. I asked, I asked Ed, what, what, so where do you think Paul fits in the history of, of theater. Um, is, is there a way for you to articulate that from your perspective? And what he said was something he had said before, but I really liked it. He said, in the pantheon of theater, if Paul is not Zeus, the whole thing is bullshit. <laughs> He also said this, and this sticks with me too. I said, um, is there anything else you want to tell me about Paul before we go? And he said, you know what? I loved him, but I wouldn't have admitted it at the time. <laughs> so that was Ed Asner. Um, two, two people are going to talk to you together uh, next. Dan Castellaneta and um, Deb LaCosta, who are incredible improvisers in L.A. They met at Second City, I believe. Um, they're both actors and... Um, uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Dan gives voice to Homer Simpson and other Simpson characters, for which he has received an Emmy Award, uh, four Emmy Awards, and Deb has written for that show as well. Um, they also both wrote for uh, the Tracy Ullman show, where Dan was an ensemble member, and Deb played multiple roles. And they are the co-founders of something called the Media Theater in Culver City, California, where they perform regularly, and I'm hoping to get out there in the fall to see them. Um, I'm also told that they uh, draw on Spolin's work in their writing as well. So that's something I thought was really interesting. Please welcome Deb and Dan. We're doing it together here. Yes. Um, if you want side coats, share the mic. Yes. First of all, thank you, Arisa, and for inviting us to special tribute to Viola Spolin and Paul Sills. It's an honor to be here at Hull House. I mean, this is the birthplace of improvisation, and I feel like it's a very sacred space. And you can really feel the energy here. So um, being here in the same room, it's where um, Neva Boyd and Viola Spolin developed their game work. And uh, that work begat Viola's Bible of Improvisation, Improvisation for the Theater. Now, in the late 70s, I was introduced to that work at Northern Illinois University through a graduate classmate of mine named Jeff Barker. He's now a professor at a, a theater, uh, the theater department in, in, um, in Iowa, Orange City, Iowa. There's a college there. But at that time, he was doing his master's thesis on Viola's work and studying the use of her, the effects of her work on creating theater, and I was part of the group of actors he assembled to play the games from her book, Improvisation for the Theater. And we even put on a show using those, those games. And this was, for me, an, an incredible eye-opening experience that combined with the reading of the interviews with Jeffrey Sweet's book and something which uh, something called, we mentioned before, something wonderful right away. Both of these things gave me direction and purpose. Now for me it was 1980s and I moved to Chicago from Detroit and worked in advertising as a copywriter. I went to see a show at Second City and I was like, what is that? <laughs> the sketch material was good, but afterwards the improvisation is what enthralled me. Um, so I, um, I wanted in as soon as I saw that. The next day I mentioned it to one of my coworkers at work and he's like, you know the ad agency will pay you uh -huh. to take classes, they'll pay for it, to take improv classes to help with your um, um, your creative process and presentational skills, so I enrolled, and it did help. It helped me realize I had to get out of advertising. <laughs> exactly what it did. Um, so then I took workshops I, with improvisation with Players Workshop with Josephine Forsberg who used the games, the Bible of that, that um, those courses were improvisation for the theater. And I studied every page, every game, and I felt like this is what theater could be, spontaneous and just alive. And I eventually took classes with Viola's son, Paul Sills. I had taken improvisation workshops uh, at Players Workshop. That's where we met. And <laughs> at the Second City, 
talk by the comedic genius and performer Don DePaulo. By then we were dating. <laughs> For a while we kept dating. <laughs> But then it was, but, and I'd taken those classes of workshops, but uh, Paul was then teaching workshops at, in the back that, you know, at Piper's Alley, which eventually became the Second City ETC. Uh, and it was in Paul's workshop where he applied Viola's work in philosophy that I saw, this is where I saw what I was looking for. I saw real theater and, and something that was, although funny and it was also deep and emotional and to me exciting and I witnessed that again and again uh, and uh, when I saw it in Paul had done a production of The Singing Bone in the Piper's Alley uh, which was another incarnation of story theater that he formed creating using Viola's work and I just remember also the most wonderful feeling you had when you got up and did a something you did one of the games and Paul would come up very quietly and go they did it. <laughs> and that was praise from, praise from God, you know. Uh, it, that was one of the greatest theater experiences I had ever had. So then Dan and I formed improv, we were formed improv groups. We played in storefronts in Chicago, wherever we could, whenever. And then we used improv to create plays with Michael Gelman at the Organic Theater. That's when we got engaged. <laughs> then we heard about workshops with David Shepard, which was, um, you know, Paul Sills' early partner in Compass Players. David was teaching scenario play work, and we jumped in, steeping ourselves in the scenario play form. That form uses the games with an outline structure um, to create improvised plays. We, we, did, we created then, in Chicago, a group called Instant Theater, and we improvised one-act plays every week. It was an amazing discipline. We just kind of cycled through play, play after play, and um, it made us realize that the games are about human connection and behavior, and that, after all, is what a play or a story is all about. Then we got married. <laughs> and then we moved to LA, and that's where Paul's game theater was at the Heliotrope, and it was waiting for us, so we signed up for workshops there and played with the amazing game teachers, Hamilton Camp and Avery Schreiber. Yeah, they were amazing teachers. Um, Dan, tell that thing that Hamilton would do when we would be, we'd be oh, improvising yeah. um, singing dialogue. S singing dialogue, and you would be on stage with Hamilton, and you would, you know, be in a shoe side. What kind of shoe do you want, you know? And after a while, if we weren't doing it, Hamilton would go, you shall wear. <laughs> Just be standing there saying yeah. um, and, and then we became part of a group called the Spolin Players out in LA. Where am I? You're right. Um, here. Where are we in the story? We okay. continue to pr uh, practice improvisation with our performance company now, Immediate Theater, which is inspired after working with Jeffrey Sweet uh, using improvisation to create theater. And we did that out on the East Coast, and we created the Improv Co-op in Los Angeles. So for many years, we've been meeting with our fellow players and friends, you know, Bernadette Burkett, um, Jane Morris, Jeff Machelski, and we've been using game work to work on each other's writing projects. And it's always a revelation to see the games break open a written work, because you feel very focused in what you're writing, and you think you wrote the most perfect thing, and it's stilted somehow. And then if you put in a game and have them re-improvise it, it just comes alive. So it, and in, in, in really magical ways sometimes. So it's just a great resource. And Viola's work has been available to... Uh, invaluable. Uh, uh, invaluable. And available and invaluable <laughs> to our, and my own writing, whenever I... Whenever I write, I just picture a, a group of players on the stage within my head and give them a suggestion in a game and then I have them improvise a scene and I just transcribe it. So when we're writing a scene together and we get stuck, we say, okay, what kind of game do we need here? Maybe we need to go to the where. Then explore and heighten that. Which leads to transformation. And of course, there are those moments when working together and being married. We each need to practice silent tension. <laughs> That transforms into something wonderful right away. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. Now, I've always heard and read about Paul, how Paul Sills talks about how important Viola's work is in building community. He always talked about that. Plus, how it's a good tool to teach democracy, mm -hmm. because democracy requires the skills that one develops by playing these games. Listening, 
speaking, respect for the other player, and being completely present, and cooperating for the good of the group, making sure everyone shines, and everyone will win. And anyone who is improvising today, whether it's in theaters, cabarets, television, film, online, or all over the world, even if they don't know it, they owe a debt to Viola and the work that she started here in Hull House, and to Paul Sills, who continued that work. So thank you, Viola and Paul, for what you brought into the world, because that world made our world. That, made, that world made our world. We have one more speaker, and then uh, we're going to see another game demonstration. And then we're going to have a reception. We hope you'll stick around for that, and that you will contribute your own stories, too. Um, Jennifer Green is, is, is the, the last speaker. Um, one of the original members of Paul's company, um, Playwrights Theatre Club, as well as an original member of the Story Theatre in 1968 was the actor and the teacher Joyce Piven, who I admire very greatly too. Um, with her husband Byrne, she established the Piven Theatre Workshop in 1972. And they have carried forward what they learned from Paul, and their school has generated numerous incredible actors, many of whom you know, many of whom you don't know, but they've gone on to um, wonderful lives based on, on the work that they've done. Jennifer Green started working with the Piven Workshop in 19, uh, 20 years ago, not 1920, but 20 years ago, <laughs> and is now the artistic director of the Piven Theater Workshop. So she is a direct descendant of Playwrights Theater Club and Story Theater herself, and has picked up the torch, I think, in marvelous, in marvelous ways. Please welcome Jennifer Green. <laughs> Oh, Mark, thank you. You are such a nice, nice guy, and it is such a pleasure to, to be here. I, uh, I never had the pleasure of working with uh, Viola or, or Paul, but I stand on their shoulders. My career I owe to them, and the reason for that is my conduit, my mentor, was Joyce Piven. Um, and we, too, at Piven Theater believe in legacy and authorship, so when Joyce heard that I was going to be here tonight, I asked her if there was anything that she wanted to, to share. Um, so I'm going to read just a little bit that she, that she offered. Viola Spolin, Paul Sills, and later Byrne Piven shaped my life and my creativity. We kept an unflinching eye on the principles that Spolin established in her theater games work and ultimately expanded them to explore our own acting and teaching method. Spolin and Sills worked and formed our teaching and directing of plays and stories, fairy tales, folk tales, literary stories, and inspired us to embrace the idea of ensemble and community. More than that, Viola and Paul put us in touch with the artist within reach of everyone. So simple. So simple. My generation felt that one must suffer for your art, live in a garret. Viola and Paul believed in joy and health. The whole is greater by the sum of its parts. Focus on the other person. Your answer is there. Find it together. And our work has always been centered around their beautiful principles of impulse, intuition, and the power of true ensemble collaboration. And that's what I carry on. And that is the gift, I think, of this work, that it can be carried on. It doesn't stop. And it's beautiful in the classroom. It's beautiful on the professional stage. But where, where, where I have been inspired, and many of our teachers have been inspired, is to keep its social justice roots intact, to find those underrepresented voices give them the freedom to speak, to find those underrepresented communities and find the ways that this work, what, it is flexible, it is fluid, it is infinitely portable, it can be brought everywhere. And this new idea of applied theater that is, that's, that's in our, our colleges and in our classrooms, 
the roots is about that portability. And the one story I'd like to tell today, which is particularly inspiring to me, um, and this is me, this is me with our Story Theater Company. Every year we have 20 people, um, all young people in high school who explore Story Theater um, and create original work by the end of that year, um, all through these principles. Um, yeah, and that's them beautiful in our little 70 seat stage up in Evanston. Um, but we decided a couple of years ago to start really sensing that this game work can be a hub of community conversation. Um, each year we come up with a new theme, always connected to social justice in one way or another. And this work, this wonderful work, now exists in Cook County Jail for Women. Um, we've been working there for three years. We've been bringing this work there. Um, Jillian Hemi, who did that gibberish trans trans translation for you, is one of our teachers who is there every week um, working with women who need to be inspired, who need to have a vision beyond where they are, um, and reflect on the humanity that exists within them that is often not able to be released in those tiny rooms. Um, another thing I think I, I would love to honor is the way that the women in, in, who participate in this program, those students, bring back these games to their selves, so that leadership of following the follower exists when we are not there. Um, and those waves of inspiration comes from this beautiful place and these beautiful people. And I am grateful to meet all of you. It feels like I have, I have met the family I have not met before. Um, and that's the one thing that has always been meaningful to me, is these games feel like home. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let's give a big hand to all the players and participants tonight. Thank you all for being here. Let's give a huge hand to Aretha Sills. And of course, our master of ceremonies, Mark Larson. Thank you so much for being here.